QuickBooks Desktop 2023 Record Investment. Let's do it with Intuit QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in QuickBooks Desktop, Get Great Guitars Practice File. We started up in a prior presentation, going through the setup process we do every time, maximizing the home page to the gray area in the view drop down. We got the hide icon bar, open windows list open, open windows open on the left hand side. Go into the reports drop down. Let's open up the major two profit and loss in the company and financial PL. There's nothing in it yet, but let's just keep it open. 010123. 212-3123. So we're working in the year of 2023 for the practice problem. Reports drop down again, company and financial this time, the big balance sheet. Let's customize it first and then do the range and change in 010123 to 123 January to December. Let's go to the fonts and numbers as well and change it to 12. Okay, yes and okay. Now, in prior presentations, we have imagined that we had a prior accounting system set up, but then we started the QuickBooks software and we wanted to transfer over the beginning balances into the QuickBooks software as of the last date of the prior system, which was 12-31-22, uh, 2022. And then we're starting to enter current year information starting January 1st, 2023. Now, even though we already had some beginning numbers in there to start with, we then wanted to take a look at some transactions that would be typical if you were starting a new business. Those would be transactions that are not always there when you do continuing business. They're not the normal day-to-day -day transactions. They're more unique transactions that are there when you start the business and possibly when you increase the size of the business. And that's going to be us funding the capital. So if we're going to be funding the capital investments or funding the investments in things like property, plant and equipment that we're going to then use to generate revenue, the startup capital that is needed, we might get that from us, the owner. So we then deposited money into the checking account or we might get a loan. So we took out a loan increase in the checking account. The other side either go into a liability for the loan payable or to the equity if we are the ones that are funding the business from our personal investments. Once we have the money, then we're gonna use that to buy the property, plant, and equipment that we're gonna to need to do whatever we're gonna do. In this case, we're gonna be selling guitars. So we might need like a store, we're gonna need furniture, we're going to need the uh, inventory so that we can go and start from our business. However, we got a substantial amount of cash here. So we're first gonna think about investing some of that cash into a short-term investment while we're holding on to it before we then invest uh, in anything else, something like stocks and bonds that might give us a return for dividends, interest, and possibly you know gains from uh, the stocks. So when we do this transaction, note that the business itself is not in the business of investment income generating stocks and bonds. We're just parking up some of our money there for the short term most types of businesses unless you're in the financial industries area are going to be like that right we're not in the business of investing but we might use some investments to park our money in the short term if we have a lot of money left if we have a lot of money part possibly due to us doing good business we're generating revenue we're increasing the value of the company and we have a lot of money and we don't have any need to reinvest that money in property, plants, and equipment, building, and so on, then we would want to distribute that money generally to the owners. In this case, the sole proprietors in a draw. For a corporation, we would give it back to the owners in the form of a dividend because the whole purpose of, of it, having it under the umbrella of the business 
is that we're using it for the business purpose to generate revenue, which would be higher returns than you could get elsewhere. If we're not using that capital, that cash to do that within the business, then we can give it to the owners and they can then invest in, you know, the the investments of, of stocks and bonds. So, the, the, so what I'm trying to point out is we wouldn't normally want our personal investments in the stocks and bonds, perhaps in our business account. Uh, we would only want it there if it was a short term thing. Otherwise, we would probably distribute it, the money to us, the individual, and then invest on the individual side. Okay, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to take some of this money. We're going to put it into an investment, imagining it being something like the stocks and bonds. If I go to the homepage, this is another transaction, which is not no part of our normal business operations. Doesn't have anything to do with the customers. Doesn't have anything to do with the vendors. And therefore, there's no really set form that is designed specifically for it. So when we go through our thought processes for entering data into the system, note that there's a double entry accounting system. Usually we want to use the forms if we can to do a transaction. If that transaction is one that occurs often in the normal accounting cycle, if there is no form for the transaction, we might then ask, is cash affected? If cash is affected, then possibly I want to use the register. That might be the easiest thing to do or use a check or a deposit form. If cash is not affected and there's no uh, transaction here or form to use, then I would use a journal entry or a register entry. So that's kind of the thought process you would go through when entering the transactions. First use a form, which is the most common thing for most day-to-day -day transactions. If that's not there, is cash affected? If it is, possibly use the register. If that's not there, then we might use the registers or a journal entry in that case. So we're going to be we're going to be having cash affected here. So we could use the registers uh, uh, in order to record the transaction. So I'm go to the register here, or I can go to the list drop down and the uh, chart of accounts. And I'm just going to double click on the checking account. So and then I'm going to say this happens as of, let's say one. Let's say one four, say oh one oh four two three, and I'm gonna say this is. I'm gonna delete the number because this is not a check, so we have no check number. I'm gonna say that we're gonna be going to Vanguard. Venge, that's gonna be our investment, and we'll set it up. So I'm gonna say a quick setup. So we're gonna invest with Vanguard. We're imagining in something like mutual funds or something like that. It's not a vendor or a customer. So once again, we have that other category that we'll choose. We're going to say 12,000. So we're going to take 12,000 out of the checking account and put it into a Vanguard account, which is going to be an other asset account. It's not cash, but it's something that can fairly easily be transferred to cash. Although there's more risk with the money in something like a Vanguard account, if and depending on the type of investment. Is it a mutual fund? Are we investing in bonds, stocks, or is it is it like a a holding account for a mutual a, a securities account of some other sort? But in any case, we'll hit the drop down and say, do we have an investment account here from the chart of accounts provided to us by QuickBooks? It would be some kind of other asset inventory. No, so we don't have one. So I'm going to set one up. I can do that by hitting the drop down and saying new, but I usually just type in here what I want first. I usually do this short and I'm going to say term investment. Hopefully I spelled that right. And then I say tab and then it asks me if I want to set it up. I'm going to say yes, let's set it up. And it's not going to be an expense account. It's going to be an, an asset account. So I'm going to say it's other current asset. It's not a bank account. It's not an accounts receivable. It is going to be current assets because it's fairly liquid. We can transfer it to cash fairly shortly. And, and we're not planning on holding on to it for a long period of time. That's basically all we need. Let's save it. Let's close it. And this is going to be investment in the memo, let's say. It's just a memo. And OK, so there we have it. Let's see what happens to the reports. Go into the balance sheet. And we, if I double click on the checking account, double click in the checking account, we've got our Vanguard investments, 12,000 coming out here. So that looks good. Notice it opens up to a check uh, form because that's the form that is used for a decrease 
to the checking account. We didn't necessarily write a check. We might have done an electronic transfer. We have no check number representing that, but this form is the form that's going to be used for a decrease of the checking account, even though we entered the data into the register. And then the other side went into this, uh, where did it go into the asset inventory short term investment right here, double clicking on that. So there is our investment. Once again, no impact on the income statement. Now there's a couple things we just want to point out if you have investments here and, and there's similar kind of problems. You, you could use QuickBooks to track your personal investments as well, or at least to record your personal investments. Although QuickBooks is not the kind of software that you're going to want to be to be you know running graphs and do your day to day calculations in terms of investment decision making processes, giving you the real time data on a day to day basis. QuickBooks is the type of software where you might want to update it periodically. So you might want to group your investments in QuickBooks periodically and then make adjustments on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis as you get the statements and make those uh, those adjustments, marking it up to possibly market value if you're investing in something like stocks. Now, there's a couple problems with that. However, when you when you start to say, OK, I've got my my asset in place, what am I going to do uh, if there's a change in value? Uh, how am I going to how am I going to deal that with that? How am I going to record it? And it, it, it's a little bit different than depending on the type of asset, because if you have the fixed assets down here, if I invest in something like a building, then typically we keep the building on the books at cost and we don't we don't really adjust the building most of the time because we don't really know what the market value of the building is. So this is part of the rationale, at least until you actually sell it, because a building is unique. You can get an appraisal, you could try to find the value of the building, but you don't really know what it is. So it's a lot more difficult to try to get the real time value of the building. If you're investing in a publicly traded exchange for stocks and bonds, then you can get a pretty good idea of what the real time value is of those stocks and bonds. They'll fluctuate a lot, but you can get an idea where, wherever it is selling at any point in time because other stocks and bonds are the exact same stocks and bonds. They're the same unit amount. They're not unique in nature and they're selling all the time. So we can get a pretty good feel for what the value is at any given time. Therefore, the argument would be as time changes, you're probably going to say, well, I want to change my short term investment and market up or down to the current fair market value to do that. You might do that in the same account here. So you might invest 12,000 in every month. You look at the statement and then you can say, OK, if it went up to 12,500, then you can write it up to 12,500 here. And then the question is, well, what do you do with the other side of the transaction and the other side, the options you have? The easiest thing to do is put it on the income statement as some kind of of income account. Now, in our case, it's not our main income. We're not in the business of just financial investments. Therefore, I wouldn't put it in the primary income. I would call it other income, which would be on the bottom of the income statement to show it as income, but not part of our normal operations. It's not what our main thing is to make money. The other option that you could do is you can put it into an equity account down here so it doesn't hit the income statement at all because you haven't realized the actual gain. So you could have an equity account that would have uh, the income. I won't get into the general, the generally accepted accounting principles on it. So you can look at, you know, the gap, what you should do in terms of generally accepted accounting principles. But these are the two kind of concepts. Putting it in equity usually is a little bit more confusing if you don't have like an accounting background with it. But you but the idea there would be that you would have the 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 amount of the difference gain or loss on the other side over here into an equity and they would kind of con they would cancel each other out in essence because you haven't actually realized the gain by selling the the actual stocks. Now, you also might create another account here that would represent the gains and losses. So you might say this is my 12,000 investment. You might create another account that shows the gains and losses so you can kind of track the difference in another account. In that other account, you might make it a, a subsidiary account to track those increases and decreases. Another thing I just want to kind of point out when you do these types of investments is that uh, you might have investments in multiple mutual funds, for example. And the question then would be, do I want to have a whole bunch of different 
mutual funds on my QuickBooks account or do I want to have fewer mutual funds? And I would argue usually you would want fewer mutual funds on your your QuickBooks account so that you can tie into the statements as, as a total amount, right? Because if you have a bunch of different mutual fund accounts here or whatever your investments are, then you're going to have to adjust them all individually within QuickBooks. And QuickBooks isn't really the area where you want to get into the detail because you want to get the summary of where you stand in QuickBooks generally. And then the detail you can find in the other reports, possibly on the Vanguard website to give you the detail of the day to day activities, or you can get more advanced software to track, you know, to dig down on the detail. So you probably don't want as much detail in the QuickBooks. However, you might have some investments if they were personal investments that are under the umbrella of like an IRA, for example. So you might, that's one way you could break things out. You could say, well, if it's not under the umbrella of an IRA or a 401k plan, maybe I put that in the short term investments. And if they are under the umbrella of an IRA or something like that, I can't pull them out as easily. Maybe I make them an other asset, not a current asset, but an other asset. That's another way that you can break it out. You can also think about breaking them out if you have investments in bond funds versus stock funds then you might break out and say these, these are my bond investments and these are my investments uh, in stocks for example but oftentimes you could also have mutual funds that are in both stocks and bonds which kind of messes up that <laughs> that kind of system but those are just a couple things to keep in mind they're not as big of an issue for most like sole proprietor type of businesses because you're not going to have a lot of your investments in your company file but again, you could use QuickBooks for your personal investments. And so, so that can become more relevant and more, you know, the question of how much detail you want uh, on the investment can become more relevant in those cases. Okay, so also note in the future, the income that would result from this could be in the form of dividends if we're investing in corporate stocks, which means that we could record the increases in dividends, which would be income in the profit and loss, which Again, I would make in an other income account, not the normal income account. We could have interest if it was bonds in the form of interest. So we get, we would have interest income and we could have the value of the stock going up. And when the value of the stock goes up, that's when you have that unrealized gain because you haven't yet sold the stock. The stock could go back down at any given time, but you're pretty confident of what the value is at that time because other stocks and bonds, which are the same in nature, if you're investing in publicly traded stocks are trading at that time for the same price. Okay, so that that is going to be that one. Next time we'll go into some purchasing of some fixed assets.